that I, I try to have notes sometimes and anyways I had a couple of thoughts about our last meeting together and um, I thought a lot about it after I left and Doug knows I keep saying oh Lord don't show that video to anybody um, and you all were saying oh thanks it was great and then I don't know maybe we missed something but I wanted to just follow up on a couple of things I had a lot of fun and I, I and I then I thought don't tell people that because you were teaching about the you know fifth commandment which is <laughs> I had a great time talking about killing and not killing. But I, I, there are a couple of things I wanted to say. Okay. Not killing, not killing. What I, one thing I wanted to say, and it, I think it goes a lot with what we talked about, um, which was the idea of exceptions to the rules, which, which you brought up. I think that sometimes there is an impression that the church is unbending, that the rules are black and white. And what you find, I'm hoping, as you learn more about the faith, is that there are exceptions because we're not God. You know, we, we, not that we make mistakes. We do. Of course we do. I'm not talking about sin. What I'm talking about is that we live in a world where evil exists. And while the commandments are all like thou shalt nots, we can talk about them in the what should you do, right? Thou shalt not kill it, in its antithesis, opposite, is of course thou shalt give life, thou shalt respect life, right? But what the church is, is saying to us in its teachings is that there are times when evil is such an imposing factor that in order to preserve the ultimate <coughs> good, we must take extreme measures. And thank God that in that, our God is an understanding, a loving, and merciful God. So that I, I don't want you to you know, kind of say, well, you know, the church says this. For example, when we talked about stem cell, a couple of people after said, well, I thought the church had no stem cell. And I said, well, because sometimes what we hear is the hammer coming down what we're not sure of is what are the exceptions. And one of the things that we're challenged, not, not just as Catholics, I would say any Christian, but specifically Catholicism as we're talking about it, is that we always have to try to figure out where not are the loopholes, not where are the exceptions, but where does the commandment call me to fidelity to it? Where does the commandment call me to an educated response? not an emotional response. And that's the difference, and that's hard, because we want to talk about things emotionally, because we love being this. We love Jesus. We're emotional about it. It's joyful. It touches my heart. It, it's in my soul. It pumps me up. It fires me up. But when we talk about these rules and these laws, we really want to be able to talk about them, not devoid of emotion, but with our emotions in balance and check, so that we can see clearly so that we don't do one or the other. We don't say, but he's such a nice guy. We really shouldn't kill him because he's a nice guy, I'm sure, underneath. God created him. He's in the image and likeness of God, isn't he? And on the other side, we say, are you kidding? Fry him, right? He's evil. We've got to get rid of him. Somewhere in there, God is asking us to find, you know, we say now, what would Jesus do? The question is really, what would Jesus have us do? All right? That's what Jesus really wants to know. What would Jesus have us do? How does Jesus want us to respond? Well, yes. Like from last week you were talking about, just another one came to me then, just like when you said, Thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. But then later on, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty much saying, whack any witch you see, and at the same time, don't, Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, I mean, but not any that you see. We have to go through the discernment any. of. Uh, yeah. Do not suffer them to live. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. 
but I think that what the well, that's that's part of the struggle. I I, I don't have an answer. That's that was what the other point. What I was going to make was the commandments are the ideals to which we are to strive, and we're to live up to the expectation. Continue to challenge ourselves. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the next commandment. And we must rejoice in the expectation building as we begin and try to live these, right? As we bump into ways in which we didn't anticipate. For example, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, did not have to worry about what to do about stem cells. They didn't have that issue. That was not a witch they had to fight. It wasn't one they thought of. And when it came into their world, into our world, we had to look back at the church and say, what is the core of what the church says? Why are we worried about stem cells? Because people were producing life and extinguishing it to harvest the stem cells. Ah, okay, well now you can't extinguish, create and extinguish life. That's the problem. Can you harvest stem cells without taking life? Yes. Okay, well that, so that's where the, that's where the rub came in not the technology of stem cell research. So that, that's, that's the piece. Same thing with in vitro fertilization. Now you see, if you read, you'll see that that is one of the ways in which the church says it's morally wrong. Well, we said if, if you implant three embryo, and those are the only ones that you've fertilized, and allow nature to take its course, that might be okay. If you fertilize 50, and you only think you're going to use 10, but you want kind of a selection, uh, that's wrong. You see what I'm saying? So we're still, think about this, we are still at a point in our lives where these technologies are still being developed, and try, we are now trying to understand it. So, so we have to think about those things. So I would just say to think about the commandments as an ideal, which can be reached, it's not an ideal we can't reach. It's an ideal we can reach. If we keep working at it. it. Might happen in our lifetime. It might not. But it, if we say, "Well, they're so high up, I'll never get there." What do we do? Well, we're just like any other children of God, right? We stop trying. So well, I've gone as far as I can go. I'm kind of okay here. God is saying, "No, the ideal is always there. The goal is to achieve it. The goal is to reach it." And again, to rejoice that we have a God who loves us, who's kind and merciful to the seventh generations, right? That, that over and over and over, God will bless, and for, he'll bless our trying and forgive our falling. And as long as we keep trying in good faith to achieve goodness. Okay, does that make sense? Does that kind of help some of, some of last week's? As, so here's one of the questions. So what do we do with the examples that we have that we don't think are okay? What do we do when there is a war which the church does not agree with? And we happen to think the bad guy needs to die. That it's evil. It's terrible. But the church says he might be evil. He might be terrible. But we are not at the point where the four points of a just war have been met. How do you reconcile that? I don't, I don't have an answer. It's part of the process of faith, process of understanding. What do you do when a relative of yours or your son or daughter marries into a family where there are children who were born through in vitro fertilization? Do you condemn the parents while the little children are sitting there looking at you with those bright eyes and life is there in front of you? Ah, it's a struggle. We have to find ways to talk about the struggles we see with compassion and understanding, not with vitriol, not with anger and, and judgment, crushing. We have to be able to find a way to take the rules <coughs> and apply them with God's love and compassion. To look at the rules and apply them with God's mercy and his forgiveness. Let God judge. It's not our place. But our place is to stand for the truth to be able to speak the truth we live and not judge the other. That's the hard part, I think. The hardest example, I think, and we say this all the time, is what do we do with a relative who's had an abortion? As we said, Dorothy Day is this 
You know, she's featured in your book. She's a woman we know had an abortion. There's a cause for her sainthood or canonization. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? We want sometimes to be unforgiving. Yeah. How do you reconcile Saul becoming Paul? I mean, look what he did. Mm -hmm. he a lot of exactly. He did. Exactly. We reconcile Paul, Saul, and Paul because Saul became Paul. Yes. Right. Now, so that made, point of that became what she is now. What happens when Saul stays Saul? That's the problem. That's where. How do we help Saul become Paul? That's that's one of the questions of faith. Is how do we talk to someone who we see is doing evil? Talk to them about the wrong that they're doing, and the love and the forgiveness that's available to them. Reminding everybody, no matter who they are and where they come from, even if they don't know it, even if it's never been produced, every, even if they've never heard the name Jesus Christ, they don't even know there's a God. They have no idea why the sun rises and sets. That if, if we represent the God we believe in, then one thing we know about them, no matter who they are and where they are on the planet right now, God's grace is available to them. Period. End of subject. It's not ours to give. It's not ours to decide. You get it and you don't. It's God's to give. God's time will come for each human being. That's why the death penalty is so sticky. Because if we can secure somebody and keep the community safe, then we must allow God's grace to be allowed to work in that person. We must allow that to happen. I know those are tough, and like I said, I don't have answers. Just some way to try and, and help make what feels like. These two commandments are tough. I know now why the priest left. <laughs> you know, I said, <laughs> you know, I said, boy, you know, there's one line in the Psalms. I never, you know, I'm a really good Catholic. I never remember which Psalm it is or what scripture it is. But there's some place it says, they duped me and I let myself be duped, you know, so I, you know, I, and the other thing I thought was, boy, you're all getting to be really good Catholics because it feels like you've been fruitful and multiplied. I'm like, man, there's a lot of, seen more of a lot of you tonight than there were the last time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I've noticed through the two years I've been studying that the getting away of what God's trying to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. and when we're trying to make a decision on something like, you know, okay, we're going to you know, do away with them and that'll be the end of the problem. But we're getting away and God not being allowed to work for that person because like, like you were talking about uh, Saul and Paul, mm -hmm. you know, Paul. If, if he was, you know, somebody was interfering with him and knowing what, they, what he did, God wouldn't have been able to work with him because of the fact that you know, they were you know, off his head mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And God just knocked him off his horse. Right. Like <laughs> yeah, we always say knocked him off his horse. Well, it does not say in the scripture that he was on a horse. But Saul right? today, he would be in Jackson on death row. Right, that he would be. Before he could ever turn into Paul. Mm -hmm. It's probably. Probably. Although we never know what happens yeah. when someone is on death row. It could happen. We still might execute them, but the grace might happen. But also think about Peter. You know, uh, Peter followed Jesus. Peter became the rock upon which our wonderful church has been built. And Peter denied him. Three times. Three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. So even the one upon whom the church is built shows us shows us that even one who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, even he had doubt and, and failings. And he, even he, looking at the physical Jesus, seeing what he did, saw the dead rise, the blind gain sight, still got scared to death when the real challenge of living this life came to him. Because what was going to happen? He knew Jesus was dying. He also knew if I stand up with this guy, that cross there might be mine. He wasn't ready for that. He ended up with his own cross in the end, but he wasn't prepared to take it then. And so we have to remember that we, we, we take in, we, we trust, we have to understand that God continues to work with us if we can get out of the way. 
And when we're standing in the way, he will try to gently nudge us, and at some point, the nudging is over, and he kicks us off the horse. But that if, and that is only going to happen if we stay open and focused to God's love. Um, I think that, the, I don't know what's happening later, but I think that I'm doing like the whole end section of the catechism on prayer. And so we'll talk more about that fidelity to understanding and listening to God's word. How do you hear it in the midst of the noise that's around us? But tonight, we move on to the next commandment. We're halfway there. We're on to commandment number six. Um, as I was doing this, I thought some people might say, well, what, what does she know about adultery? What does she know about all this stuff? But if you read the chapter, how many read the chapter? <laughs> so, it's usually I have more hands, and I think they really did it this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I said, boy, was that not the nunniest moment you ever lived? You know, I, was so, I felt like such a nun at that moment, you know? I always try to say I'm kind of the new and improved model, you know, like not with the, you know, you gotta, but God felt good to say, how many of you did your homework? And, and then know that some of you are going to come back this time and go, I did it, I did it. It's a great feeling, it really is. Um, okay, we're going to talk about some interesting things tonight. Fifth commandment, we talked about justice, allowing God's grace to enter into that <coughs> death, death is final, you know, that we respect life and that we have to do an honest assessment of safety, honest assessment of safety. That sounds kind of like a risk management, right? Someone in a hospital. But that's what we're doing, an honest assessment. Honest meaning, can we push this to the limit and believe that we will still be safe? And not the least common denominator just because we're scared, right? An honest assessment of our safety. Can we truly keep ourselves safe without taking the life of another? That's a big question, okay? So that's, the, that's five. Six talks about maturity and relationship. And I would say they go together, you know, in some ways. But in, in the issue of this commandment, we start with thou shalt not commit adultery. It's kind of the end, right? We have to get to the point where you're married first in order for this to make any sense, right? And so we have to look at what marriage is about. Because this, this commandment is specifically about the relationship between a husband and a wife, all right? It's about the breaking of the bond of till death do us part, right? Marriage vows are what they are. They say what they say. And when that bond is broken through adultery, that's when we see the death of a marriage. Okay, that's, that's what we understand this to be saying to us. Okay, so far so good? So we're going to talk about things like chastity. Right? Does anyone think they understand chastity? I don't get that one. Marital fidelity. What does that mean? What's marital fidelity? We're going to talk about sex and sexuality. Right? Um, we're going to talk about things that sometimes feel a little uncomfortable. And you'll hear a lot of times people who don't want to talk about these things, they'll say, I want the church out of my bedroom. I don't want the church to be in, talking to me about these issues. The church doesn't want to be in your bedroom either, right? No <laughs> <laughs> Trust me on this one, right? We're not, you know, what we want, what we need, and what is important is that we talk about the relationships, the relationship of a husband and wife. Because the relationship between the husband and wife, the marriage, the man and a woman is a mirror of what? God's love, right? Jesus talks about the church and the bride, right? The bridegroom. If you read the Song of Songs, how many of you have read that? Absolutely one of the most beautiful, beautiful writings. Absolutely filled with passionate, intimate love. Poetry, unbelievable stuff, beautiful. This is not a book that says sex is bad. This is not a church that says, oh, your body is bad. This is a church that says, your body is so awesome. Your body is so great. You as a woman and you as a man are so amazing that we call you to the fullness of who you are in your sexual being, not in the badness of it, right? We call you to the joy. Now, 
If you read in the chapter, I'm going to jump around a little bit because uh, I'll keep going back to those, but you'll see I hate notes. When we talk about the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve come together. They're romping through the woods, right? Romping through the Garden of Eden. You know, that whole image, they're naked, they're running around, and we're like, oh my God, you know, thank God for the fig leaves, and you know. <laughs> the idea when you think about it is that they lived an absolutely unified life. They were two of the most mature, loving, faithful, united people God ever created. They were the example to us of how we are to live as men and women. It was evil that broke them up. It was the sin of greed, the sin of wanting something that you were not to have, that opened their eyes to how things could be destroyed. Right? So think back to what God is calling us to in this thou shalt not commit adultery or in the positive side, thou shalt live faithfully, chastely, in fidelity. God is asking us to try to find within us the Adam and Eve DNA that we were all born with, right? We had the original sin. God's really saying through this, find what was before the sin. Try to recapture what was Adam and Eve in the innocence and the love and the fullness and the respect and maturity of who they were. That's what this is calling us to. Wow, that to me is like, who would not want to be called to that? Who would not want to do that? But we live in the same situation. There is a snake in the garden all the time trying to pull us apart. Yes? I, I know that, you know, growing up and plus, uh, changing in different denominations, uh, I've noticed that one is, you know, hush hush and the other one is, no, don't you dare do that. That's mm -hmm. wrong, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the worst thing you can do. And I don't understand why they, they promote that. I mean, they, they all do it. It's not just one or two. Mm -hmm. like, they all do it. Right. They either don't talk about it or they like, you know, don't do anything. Don't mm -hmm. dare touch nobody. Yeah. I mean, and they try to make it out like <laughs> yeah, we know it's not. I know. And that, but what happens? We know that when we put those kinds of, of uh, extreme conditions and everything is bad, 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 bad. You know, again, like I said, we're, we're just like any other child of God. You know, when you start imposing those things, what happens to us? We all become eighth graders, you know? That once, exactly, it, no matter how old we are, once somebody starts kind of pushing that, unless we are adult and mature. That is one of the most important parts of this commandment. It has to do with maturity. Maturity has to do with integration. Your body and your soul together, not separate. Not separate. And sometimes what people say was, I have to, my body's bad because it has feelings I can't always control. So if I just shut down my body and pay attention to my soul, I'll be holy. <laughs> Holier than now, right? I'll be pure. It's not who we are. It's not who we are as human beings. It's just not who we are. That love that we have, that ability to create life, to engage in the procreative design of God, has to be lived out or, or we die. No, it just has to. I mean, there's no way. Flowers can't grow and they don't stop growing and blooming, right? Unless something happens to the soil, unless something happens. Then we think, oh, it's a bad season, wasn't it? Because the flowers didn't come out. We are about that growth and that blossoming. That's what this is about. So I'm gonna kind of go to my notes for a second because there are a couple of things I wanna make sure we cover. The issue of sex is the act, the conjugal act, sex, having sex, we all understand that. Sexuality involves the entire person. It's the unity of the body and soul, all right? It's the capacity to love and procreate, forming bonds, forming connections, forming unitive relationships, all right? Or a unified relationship. The marriage vows, as we said, are a mirror of God's covenant for us. God loves us the way we 
are to love our spouses, right? Now, think about that. So when we're all at Mass and they do the reading, again, I, I'm always bad about where stuff is, but when they do the one that says, wives, obey your husbands, right? Everybody's like, I hate that one. Yeah, right. They, well, the husbands are going, do you hear that? What the husbands do not hear, what the husbands do not hear, because they're too busy yelling in your ear, is husbands love your wives as the God loves the church. I hate to tell you, I'm more willing to be obedient to a couple of things than the challenge to love as God loves the church. That is an intense love. So let's not take things out of context and only read the parts that suit us, right? Let's make sure we take the whole piece. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to love as Christ loves, what it means to be obedient. What does this mean? Sexuality, the idea of coming into ourselves, is also about, this is a tough one, I'm not sure we'll get really what all this entails tonight, but what it also involves is understanding <coughs> our gender, our gender identity, all right? Who I am, you are, you are as a woman, in our place in the world, and who you are, and you are as men, in your place, your gender identity is involved in sexuality, all right? Because how we, if we are to unite, if we are to be united, one, the unitive relationship of, we have to go back to <coughs> the Adam and Eve, right? Remember that Eve came from Adam, right? They were one. And we have to try to find that relationship again. So that's a, that's a challenge. Is everybody okay? So far so good? Any questions? Any answers? <laughs> no? Good. Okay. We're ready to keep going? All right. So we have to accept our sexual or our gender identity, our sexual identity. Who I am as a woman, what does that mean to my responsibility in this unitive relationship, this procreative relationship that is called marriage? Who am I in as a man? What is my role in this? How am I to be one with my spouse? What does that look like? How do I make this vow? And so I wanted to talk to you. Doug was, was with us at Mass this morning, and some of you know um, that I, obviously you know I'm a nun, right? You know that. So you know that nuns take vows, right? <laughs> Married people take vows, nun take, nuns take vows. I, I would say that we all take similar vows, right? But we just call them different things. I take a vow of poverty, chastity, obedience, and service of the poor. I make four vows, all right? So service of the poor is really the top vow. We live them by living chastely, in poverty, and in obedience. So when we talked about that husband and wife obedience, some people say I'm married to God, or married to the church, or I have a relationship that I'm responsible to in the church. You have an expectation of me, right? I don't get to just say, hey, man, I'm not married to anybody, so, you know, Unless, unless Benedict comes and wants me to do something, I don't have to worry about it. I'm responsible to you. I am to live my vows out in a way that is faithful so that you can see that. And I have the expectation that as married couples, you will live out your vows in a way that I can be a witness to that and see it. We've made promises, not just to the church, but we've made promises to each other that we will live our lives in a certain way so that we all mirror the covenant love of God. My life mirrors the covenant love of God in a way differently than the life of a married person. But our vows are the same. So here's a challenge. On Monday, it's not really a challenge, but this is the interesting part. My particular community, we don't make our vows perpetually. You don't know what that, you know what that means? means it, some sisters take their vows once, and they're about seven to eight years vocation. They make their vows once, and they never have to make them again. They can have an anniversary, but they're perpetual. They make them once, it's for life. They don't ever have to renew them. St. Vincent de Paul thought that that was, uh, that people could grow weary, and if you didn't have a way to kind of check yourself, you know, man, this is like in the 1600s that St. Vincent de Paul is saying, he said, I think, I think that this is a hard life these women live and these priests that I'm spending time with live. I think they should 
maybe check on those vows every year. So the vows I live are annual, right. which means that every year on the Feast of the Annunciation, I don't just renew them like in an anniversary celebration. I actually retake them. Right? So I have the choice to not take them. I can say, or my community can say, I don't think this is working anymore. I don't, I don't think you can live these anymore. It's a tough, tough thing. Now, the, how many of you are married? All right, wedding day, marriage, anniversary day comes. The vows cease. Would you marry the same person again? At that moment in time. Think about that. There are times when these vows are tough. Some years you think, absolutely. He's the best thing on the planet, has been, always will be. Maybe the next year, oh, you know, it's a dimmed a little bit, right? Say, do this again. Think about our vows as commitments that we have to continue. Don't, don't let it get stale or old. When your anniversaries come, talk about what it was like when you first married. What is it like now? Be honest enough to say, you know, I'm struggling. There are some things I'm struggling with. You know, and I need you to pray with me. I need you to think about how much stronger our marriages could be if we were able to say, gosh, I, I, I'm just not sure. You know, I, I'm staying in it. I'm, I'm here. But you've got to help me. You know, there, there are some things I'm struggling with. Because wouldn't that be a more honest way for us to deal with, this is just not working for me. I'm out of here. It's just not happening. I've got to go. Right? We've seen it over and over and over again. But if we continue to talk about what we're struggling with, every year in November, I have to ask to renew my vows. So I have to go to a superior and say, I think, I feel, I believe that I should renew my vows. I, I believe that I should do this again. And she usually, thank God, for not, you know, last 10 years, she has said, yes, you can renew your vows. But I always know that when I walk in there, I have to have a conversation about what was difficult in living them. For example, many of you know I'm at daybreak right now, right? This new homeless center. A month before I was asked to start working at daybreak and start a whole new work that I had no intentions of doing, I thought I was going to New Mexico to work with Native Americans, which I have been asking to do for five years. For five years, right? And they said, guess what? <laughs> You're not going to New Mexico. You're going to stay here. That was in November. Then it was like, okay, well, hey, do you want to renew those vows this year? <laughs> no, no, no. You know, I'll do poverty and I'll do chastity, but that obedience thing is a little tough right now, you know, because those Native American missions were like right there. I even had an interview. I was going to meet the bishop. I was going to meet the bishop, and everything was called off so that I could stay here and make it. Now I'm happy. You know, this is great. But that's what fidelity to obedience is. So I just give you that as an example because I think that we have to talk about the marriage vows in a similar way. Uh, my vows are not any more difficult or any easier to live. The poverty that I live is not any more difficult than the poverty that married couples living on low income or married couples who are deciding to have kids and realizing mm, kids are expensive. Married couples who want to uh, get an education and they're trying to put one of the spouses through medical school. Come on, that's, that's living a vow of poverty if the commitment to stay together is there. So, I mean, we're kind of talking a lot about marriage, but it's really, really important because when we come to the point of talking about that adultery, that break, we have to say, what have we done to understand the strength of the commitment we've had to make in this marriage? All right. What have we had to do? What do we have to do to make that happen? And we're also going to talk about what happens when that commitment just can't be con continued. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that. All right. So one of my favorite lines in this, that all are called to chastity. It's an apprenticeship, I love this, an apprenticeship of self-mastery, a training in human freedom. Well, what the heck does that mean? An apprentice in self-mastery. It means... You don't have to be perfect, right? It means that you must try self-mastery. means if you are an apprentice to something, right? 
you kind of have an idea that you think you like carpentry and you're good with your hands and you don't like slam your nail every time you have a hammer in your hand, right? So you think, I want to go into carpentry and you become an apprentice and you work with somebody who helps you to become that. That's what your marriage is like. You're becoming an apprentice with one another and you also have to have self-mastery, which means you have to have some control and integration of the body and the soul. Because the body has, as we know, I'm just going to say it, a mind of its own sometimes, right? And we have to be able to understand that and not get down on ourselves and also not live in the weakness of that, all right? End of the chapter, you know, we talked about the theology of the body. It reminds us that John Paul II says, my God, the body is exquisite. It's exquisite. There's nothing wrong with it. It is our ability to master it. It's our ability or our struggle and our striving to have control so that we can live it in its beauty. In its beauty. Okay, so far so good? All right, so we have self-discipline. We have to have some control. Internal freedoms that, you know, some people say, well, you know, do we all live chastity? Well, yeah, we all do, because we all have to live integrated lives. I have to live chastity. My chastity is lived in the celibate life. Your chastity, if you're married, is lived in the marriage, in the nuptial life. If you're single, it's married in what way? Through abstinence. Right? It's through not having sex if you're single. So we all are called to this integration. We're all called to having that mastery of ourselves in the different lives that we have are now called to live in. So, so far so good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you're all saying, forget about it, <laughs> right? Okay, now I also love this part. It also says that this chastity that we're living, you know, this chastity we're all called to, is lived in progression in different stages of life. And it is most difficultly lived when? In adolescence, God help us, right? I mean, it is most difficult at those stages of growth, those stages of growth where we are moving from childish, uncontrolled, undisciplined, not mature behavior and age to a period of maturity, right? There is nothing more for, I, I, how many, anybody here teach middle school? They, those pe people, I don't care, no canonization process, they are just immediate saints. Seven. <laughs> Seventh and eighth grade? Oh my gosh. How do those people, I just think that is just to me, talk about not having self-mastery and not just, oh my goodness. It goes into the early years of high school, but apply those to what we're talking about. Those are some of the most difficult years. They are some of the most difficult years. And think about the world we live in right now. Those are the years when children are exposed to so much in the culture that we live in. Right? We have to now put parental controls on our TVs. I mean, how many of us live parental controls? Wasn't anything on there we couldn't watch, right? At least we didn't think so, except for the marble man smoking and people drinking, and right? Think about what our children look at, and think about in the same time the church and God are saying, these are the years these are the years when that maturity must begin to grow. Oh my goodness, what we put those kids through, right? How we should support them and how we should create an environment where the goodness in their maturity can happen, not watch them kind of like a cat trying to fight itself out of a brown bag, you know? Not watch them struggle with all the things that are bumping up against them and confusing them, but helping them clear the path so that maturity can develop. And they can come into their teen years and their 20s ready and able to start making some of these commitments that we're going to call them to when they get to be 18, 19, and 20, right? Say, well, isn't it time you thought about settling down, son? You've got to be kidding, right? Who prepared them for that? That's what we have to do. We have to help them with that. So that's what we have to think about, right? That this chastity, this fidelity we're being called to, this strength of character we're being called to, has to be formed at some of the most difficult times in our lives. 
All right, now we're going to get into the the difficult stuff that you know always um, makes people's face turns red. And sometimes when when you give this kind of talk, I say the words and you all turn beet red because you know it's like <laughs> I can't believe she just said fornication. Oh my God! <laughs> so the virtues of chastity develop relationships. They blossom into friendships. We all know this, right? Your marriage partner should be your friend first, right? You know, sometimes, um, no, they don't. And you know, I have to say, sometimes culture takes what is so deep and so intimate and so profound, and they put it on a poster and make it sentimental and trite, right? Right? You, they, sh they should be friends first. I, you, come on. It takes a long time to become somebody's friend. I don't, I'm like Facebook, you know? Friendship needs to develop. I'm sorry, but you know, I know a lot of people, but I really don't have 300 friends. I don't. I don't want 300 friends. That is way too much work. Maintaining, I can't maintain like the 10 I try to keep really in touch with. I, I, you know, I, but, so think about that. This chastity, this, this focused life we're being called to, is calling us to friendship first. To friendship first, okay? So, now, here we go. What are the things that separate us? Lust, right? You all get your books and look up the definitions. You're right. Now, the, this is the other part. Think about these words when you were in the eighth grade, all right? These were the words you took your dictionary and you tried to look them up, right? Now, the words kids are looking up today, I don't, that, I start, woo! These are the things that, yeah, these are the things that you didn't want to, oh, I'm not going to talk about that. These are the sins, lust. It's not love, lust, right? Masturbation, we're going to talk about that. Fornication, incest, sexual abuse, pornography, prostitution, rape, homosexual acts. Oh, you feel dirty just saying this stuff, right? You're like, I don't want to talk about that stuff. Go back to the love stuff. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden, you know? When Adam and Eve were having a great time. Well, we can't. We can't. We're not... We do, and we need to understand what these things are because we need to understand how without our faith, without the love of God, without God's grace... We are all capable of this. We are all capable of things. All right? That's the problem is we think these are for other people. I'm a good Catholic. I'm a good Christian. I know not to do those things. But remember what sin is. Not only what I do, it's what I don't do, it's what I think. Right? Sin has all kinds of dimensions to it. So we've got to think about that. We've got to think about that. All right, so we're going to talk about them. Why are these things sinful? Why is lust? Why is masturbation? Think about what we said about, hmm? It's outside of marriage. Marriage has two qualities. It's unitive, right? It unites and should be open to procreation, right? To life. And it doesn't bear good fruit. Hmm? It's not fruitful, and it doesn't bear good fruit doesn't bear good fruit. Masturbation doesn't bear good fruit. All right? This doesn't. Doesn't happen. Lust doesn't bear good fruit. At least for one person it doesn't, right? Cuz you're just being used. This is about use and abuse. That's what this is about. When you look at this, it goes back to the 5th commandment a little bit. Because what does it do? It creates the death of a relationship. It brings about the death of what should have been life-giving. That's what these things do. All right? There are definitions of each of them in your book. And I kind of looked at them and I thought, do we need the definitions? But I think, I, think that we, I think we need to really understand what we're talking about here. All right? So uh, we're not going to review them all because I, I, you're always pressured for time. But I think that we have to think about the issue of fornication. Right? Someone says, he's a fornicator. We think, oh my god, what is that? It means having sex outside of marriage. Lots of people are doing this, right? Lots of people. Some of us may have lived or had sex outside of marriage. It's not the end of the world, right? 
because we have the grace to fix, we have the grace to find the unity, we have the grace to enter into right relationships. All right? That's what's important, is for us to look at these things and say, while they may have been a part of my life, they don't need to be a part of my I know what the opposite of this is, and that's what I want. I may have been abusive in my marriage, but I can change that. I may have looked at pornography, but I can stop. If we have the integration and the maturity that chastity calls us to in the first place. If we are not mature, if we are not integrated in our body and our soul, these things will defeat us. Pornography will get into our lives and it will continue to tempt us and it will continue to tell us, well, it's nothing wrong. You're not really hurting anybody by looking, right? No. By sitting there and looking at that, you're not spending time with your loved one, are you? Right? By looking at this, you're tempting your own body to come out of balance and to experience <coughs> lustful thoughts. Think about the progression of what all this stuff does. All right? It leads itself into more and more of this. These are not isolated things, not like some of us commit lust. Right? Some of us masturbate. Some of us look at pornography. Pornography can lead to masturbation. Pornography can lead to lust. Pornography can lead to or might be a part of fornication. Right? That's why this stuff becomes so insidious. Because it becomes like, know, like a web that, or like a creepy crawly thing that kind of gets in and starts to fester. It's a temptation, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, it, and like I said before, you know, we don't want to say, oh, bad, bad, bad. This stuff is bad. Not because it's a topic of sex. Not because of that. It's bad because it's so destructive. <coughs> That's why it's bad. Using drugs and alcohol can weaken us so that we don't see that this is a problem, right? We have to look at all of those things and say, how are we weakening our ability to live the faithful life? Marriage is not easy. It doesn't come just because you found your soulmate, right? It can be great when you did and you have and you'll have wonderful years, but we will be tempted because our bodies are what they are. And they feel what they feel and they go through what they go through, and we have to be mature enough to deal with it. So not to be scared of these, but to know them when we see them, to be able to address them, to be able to call each other out on them, to be able to talk to our children about them, to talk to your child about sexual abuse. It's a difficult, difficult thing. But we know how important it is that that conversation has to happen. To talk about the issues of rape are so difficult. But what is the one fear you have when you send your child off to college? Right? How many parents do we know? And this is where we start putting these pieces together, OK? And it, these are challenging things. Now, I'm just being straight up honest with you. How many parents will say, I'm sending my daughter off to college. I trust her. I don't trust everyone around her. I don't want her to get pregnant. So for her protection, I'll put her on the pill. Poof. We're safe now. At least if something happens, she won't get pregnant. What kind of thinking is that? What kind of thinking? What is the honest assessment of safety? What's an honest assessment of safety? Is to help your child be integrated, to help your child be mature and responsible. Now, things happen, we know that. But to anticipate it to the point where we go against something else that we believe doesn't make a whole lot of sense. All of this begins to chip away at the foundation. It is chipping away at the rock of Peter, right, who got scared. And instead of standing beside Jesus and the truth of who Jesus was, chose to deny him. 
Yes. Just your hit on that one again, and it just, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he denied it three times. Mm -hmm. What would have happened if he had them? Well, we wouldn't be here. This church wouldn't be here. Not They'd in the way we know right, it. They'd have whacked him and, and nailed him right up next to him. He Christ. might have. Does that mean the church would have? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, who's to say? The church was already forming. And like, uh, right? was, I think Father, Father McDonald was talking about how, how, how linear we look at things and how mm -hmm. he sees it as a whole. Kind of like described it as a train going by. Right. And God could be up here seeing the whole train. We're going to see the first car, second car, and all that. Right. He goes, well, let's see. He goes, maybe train me three times, but he's going to start this church over here before mm -hmm. they nail him to one. So why don't we just give him a pass on that? <laughs> <laughs> it might, might be. But what we know is that because Peter wasn't killed, the church looks the way it looks today. Had, she, had Peter stood up, not denied Jesus, it would be maybe a different church. I don't know. We can't, we, there's no way for us to know. We live in the church we live in. But I, I would say you're right, that the sense, I, the way I use it, and I, I use this example tonight, is I, can, I think about it like a, like a jigsaw puzzle, you know? And we all have our piece. We all are a piece of this puzzle. And God sees the cover of the box. And we don't, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? We're still wondering what that cover of the box, yeah, we're trying to wonder, is that blue sky or is that blue ocean, you know? Like, this is my piece, am, am I a rock or am I like something else, I, you know? Where am I in the puzzle? Because we don't, but, but we do have the cover of the box. Because it's called sacred scripture and tradition and the stories and the heritage that we have as Catholic Christians. We do have the cover. We just have to see it more clearly. I always think about the, the healing that Jesus, you know, with the blind man and he rubs his eyes. I always forget which sequence it is. But the guy says, well, yeah, I think I can see, but everybody looks like moving trees, right? We're kind of in the moving tree place, you know, where we know it's there. And he's trying to focus it in for us. So I, I think you can use all of those. It's there. It was always there. Whether Peter denied him or not, it's there. And how it's being lived out has to do with how faithful we are to it. And I would say we are in a tough place right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping Jesus doesn't come right now because I'm not thinking we're ready, you know. I think there's a lot of things going on that we need to get in order. You know, I think that, that those are important pieces and that's what we're striving to do. Okay, so the church calls us to a higher order of behavior. These are not just do's and don'ts. This is not just slap your hand, no, praise you, yes. This is a higher order of maturity that we're called to. All right? So coming in as adults, this is, can be a challenge. All right. So when we talk about this relationship that is unitive and procreative, we talk about the idea that this life of marriage should create new life. Be open to it. Therefore, no artificial contraception should interfere with that. Makes sense, right? That makes perfect sense. If it's supposed to be open to life, anything that doesn't help life shouldn't be a part of it. That makes sense. Until, hmm, you think, well, I can't have 10 kids. <laughs> and it seems like I'm pretty capable of having 10 kids, right? And you know some women, they can have a whole bunch of kids, and they still look like they've never had one. But the church also says there are natural ways which we can live out the responsibility of the life we're called to. We don't have to succumb to artificial ways. We don't have to medicate and protect ourselves. We, over at FAM, I may have said this before, when I was working at Family Advancement Ministry, and I think I did say this, that a lot of churches said, well, we aren't going to help because you don't, use, you don't provide contraception, and that's just easier. I guess, but it doesn't call anyone to more mature behavior, does it? It just says, well, you know, if you're going to do that, you might as well do it, but here's some protection so you don't have all these babies because that's really the problem. Babies are not the problem. The behavior is the problem. The lack of maturity is the problem. The lack of responsibility is the problem. The lack of understanding that the conjugal act should be open to life is the problem. That when we don't think about those things, we're not responsible. Natural family planning is a way in which the church says responsible parents who may not be able to afford a child right now in their relationship, who might have aspirations for medical school or law school, or, which will help that family grow 
and the time for children will be later, there are natural ways that we can work together and it will involve some sacrifice. Because it doesn't just mean that you're going to have figure out when can we have a kid and when can't we have a kid, right? It might mean that you must abstain from what you as a married couple right, have the right to. That unity, that love relationship, the intimacy of a husband and wife. You may have to sacrifice that in order to live responsibly. That is living maturity. That is living in respect for one another. All right? So far, so good. You're looking sleepy. How am I on time, too? I'm just going. Good? Ooh, okay. All right. So, so we've got natural family planning. We talked about maturity and responsibility. Uh, that love is expressed in more ways than the conjugal act. Abstaining from the conjugal act might be the answer to the responsible behavior you're called to. All right? Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's, that's not. Young love, two young people, you know, mm, a little tough. They're married, right? The honeymoon isn't over yet, baby, right? Uh, well, if you have bills to pay and you have college tuition and you have aspirations and you want to buy a house and you want to have kids that go to college, it might mean that you need to get some control of your behavior, right? That you need to look at the responsible behavior. Thou shalt not commit adultery has a lot before we get to adultery, right? All of this has to be in place and secure and understood to understand what happens in the end. Because this is not just a one act, that happens, it's all over. It's about what is the relationship of the husband and wife in which the act of adultery occurs we have to understand that part first to understand how destructive this is. Got it? Yeah? All right, good. You, you sticking with me? Good. Because we don't, we don't have much, much further to go. So, these are the things. Yeah. Oh, he's got to switch. My seventh grade daughter also had sex ed this week, so it's kind of neat. Oh. <laughs> she had her class today, and, said, and she said yeah. they said a word. Oh, yeah. No, they, they're, we're good? We're back on. All right. So, so all right, so, so we want to talk about three things, four things that were at the end of your um, chapter. And I, I am trying to cover it because I do think it's really important, and I don't mean to just keep belaboring the point of responsibility, but I think it is so essential to our understanding how we can live a good and faithful life. I want to know that I'm living my celibate life not in such a way that you can say, well, she's got no relationships, right? Good for her. I don't see her having any, any particular friends or anything, right? I want you to look at me and say, man, that woman, she's living her fidelity, her celibacy well. You know, because she can love lots of people, you know? Because her, she's witnessing to God's love for everybody. I want to be able to talk to married couples and see a love relationship that says these people know one another. They finish each other's sentences, you know? I mean, that kind of connection. That they don't have to, well, they love to be beside each other, but even when they're across the room and away from each other, I know that they go together, right? You know those kind of couples. That's a beautiful thing. That's why I keep harping on that sense of responsibility and maturity. It's hard to get to, but it is absolute if we want this to be the beautiful relationship that God calls it to. We looked at the sins, and we will talk a little bit more about them probably before we, did, we end. But we also want to talk about the things that break up, that bring about the end of a marriage, that get to the point. And some of you may have experienced these, so I know they're sometimes difficult to talk about. Um, but I think it's important, again, that we talk about when we're here, not that we take away all the emotion because we come with our whole lives here, all right? So some of us in this room may have used contraception. Some of us may have had sex out of marriage. Some <coughs> of us may have been divorced. Some of us may have been uh, abused sexually. Some of us had those, and we know the horror and the pain of them, all right? 
And so that's very difficult. Others of us have not experienced those things. We've not experienced it. We don't know. We can try to understand. And that's what we have to say. That bit of judgment is in, important. So when we talk about these things emotionally, like the sins are emotional. We talk about masturbation. We talk about lust and fornication. Oh, it just feels, it feels bad, right? These four things we're going to talk about, we get back into the kind of law thing, you know? So adultery, divorce, what are my four things? Cohabitation and polygamy. All right, so, and homosexuality. Homo oh, that was in the other part. We're going to talk about that in relation to this. Okay, so adultery violates the covenant, period. It violates the covenant, right? Till death do us part. It violates the covenant. The covenant is I will be faithful to you in this relationship, right? I will be united to you. I will be open to life with you. Adultery breaks that covenant and it allows lust and fornication and all those other things into the relationship. It's not just into that one person. Because one single person who's not married and engages in those things is, is sinful and is not in a relationship where they can, can be responsible, right? If a single person is looking at pornography, something is sinful. When a married person is allowing those things in, it doesn't just affect them. It affects the one they have sacramentally bound to. They are no longer just themselves. All right? That's the important part. That's the important part to remember. So what you do affects not just you but the other. So adultery, having a relation, sexual relationship with somebody outside the marriage, a married person having a relationship with someone outside the marriage, it's an injustice. It is an injustice. It takes away the rights of someone else. It wounds them. That's why it's wrong. Divorce breaks the promise. Divorce breaks the promise. Now, does divorce happen? Yes. Does the church want it to happen? No. When we talk about divorce, we're back kind of in the same thing when we talked about, do we have the death penalty? Yeah. Do we never want to use it? Yeah, we don't ever really want to have to use it. Is divorce possible? It might be, but what have we done to try to avoid it? What have we done to try to strengthen this relationship that seems to be falling apart? What efforts have we made to repair wounds, to repair damage, to help heal wounds? What have we done? What are the superman efforts we've made? Because that's what the church is calling us to, that this divorce may not have to happen, all right? So, but it happens. In the old days, and this is another one of those kind of misconceptions, in the old days, that's what we say nowadays, right? In the old days, if you were divorced, you know, it was terrible. You couldn't come to church, you couldn't receive communion, it was terrible. That's not the case today. If this happens in a family, if there was abuse, sexual, uh, sexual or physical abuse, and divorce had to occur, civil divorce, the marriage civilly is dissolved. It does not mean the marriage is sacramentally dissolved, correct? What dissolves that? Or what says, it says it didn't happen, right? And Nolman says that, the, that it didn't happen, right? That's totally, totally, totally different, okay? Because even if one has a civil divorce, meaning we are not con living together, we're not doing our taxes together anymore, we don't have any of those responsibilities, we still have a faith and fidelity responsibility. Can we go out and find another partner? No. The church hasn't dissolved our vows to one another. What we have said together is that something, something has destroyed this bond here right now. The church does not see that bond broken. The church says, if you can't live in the same house, you are now called to a greater 
and it may be a more difficult way of living because now you must live as though you are a single person in relation to intimate relationships with others because remember we talked about this the last time it is not the murderer that the church has a problem with it's the act of murder right so it is not that you're divorced it's if you have relationships outside of your marriage which the church still recognizes right so if you are divorced and you have a relationship with someone else before your marriage is annulled or if it gets annulled then you are violating that relationship you're committing adultery that's tough that's hard that's where we begin to judge one another that's where we begin to get frustrated with these rules and these laws because this gets complicated divorce does not mean the end of the sacramental relationship right? that's really important to understand but it does not if we live separate from our spouse and continue to live faithful <coughs> to the sacramental nuptial part of our lives we're okay it's when we move out of that and say well now that I'm divorced I can go look for another girlfriend I can look for a boyfriend I can begin to look for other relationships then we start seeing ourselves falling into the issues of moving toward fornication and adultery okay yeah that's all icky no one really likes to hear that stuff yeah they're like whoa wait a minute you know and that's when we start thinking running through your head are all these people right thinking oh well, what about him what about her this is the hardcore stuff that the church calls us to, okay? Cohabitation. It's really yes. About when a marriage breaks up civilly, mm -hmm. um, and one of the two married couples doesn't care about the mm -hmm. holy bond of matrimony, and so he or she does have relationships and does mm -hmm. get married and has children and mm -hmm. whatever, um, I don't. I don't know why should that person get to have it all and the other person deny him or herself at all because I mean the call I mean do you see what I'm saying like well the, here's the question you know, here's here's something for you to think about all right I understand saying okay I was married to this person I'm trying to live faithfully like I am leave, abstaining like, she chose and to leave and no, they chose to leave they found another partner they've had kids they seem to be really doing well they're even still coming to the church I go to right Oof, that feels painful right so what happens you start feeling like well why don't I get to have that why can't I be happy right they look happy don't they look happy are they happy in the eyes of the church Happy isn't the question. Faithfulness is the question. Fidelity is the question. Chastity is the question. That's the hard part. Because what we then say is our happiness is in our responsible living. Can I worthily walk up in that communion line and receive Jesus when what I want is what someone else has even though I know what they're doing is wrong? Right? But if I can walk up and say, I know that he looks happy, and it really hurts me, and it really hurts my children to see this, the children we had together, and I know that this is wrong, that's experiencing the woundedness that, adultery hap that happens in adultery. That's why we said in the beginning, that's why this is the commandment, because it creates that pain. That's wounds. And what we want we know this. When we're wounded, we want someone to fix it. And how do you fix wounds? Well, you make them all better, right? But sometimes wounds need to be scraped and they don't heal so quickly. And sometimes you can put a bandage over it and I don't see the wound anymore. The wound is still there. So I, this, is, this is so hard. And I keep saying, I know why the priests are not here. Because this is tough stuff. <laughs> and it's tough stuff because you know what? I'm, I'm not living that. I, I, I have my own stuff that I have to deal with, you know, in, in relation to this. But it's, it's, it's living the hard core thing. But knowing that living it faithfully, you know, not just has eternal rewards. You know, sometimes we say that and it sounds kind of trite. And we say, well, I, I want some rewards now because this is hard, right? But it's knowing that by living this fidelity, by looking at these and saying these are not 
punishments that we're forced to live. These are what God has said will bring you to the kingdom. These are the things that will open the doors and the alleluias will happen. These are the things that mirror the Adam and Eve I called you to be in the very beginning. So it might seem like he's good now, but in the end, this isn't where happiness will be found. That's, I know that's hard, but does that, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay, it's tough. Wow. Oof. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, so, so we look at the issues of cohabitation. Why do, why do young people, yeah? To me, Father and Mother Angelica said it perfectly. It's conscience. It's conscience? It's conscience, and yeah. it feel good. Then it's not right. Then it's, that's right. That's right. But, but I think what she's saying is that the conscience is gone. The conscience, for somebody, it seems to, you know, not get it. And, but her conscience, or our conscience is saying, oh, this feels bad. But I, why do young people live together before they get married? Well, let's see if this will work, right? Because if this works, then we'll go get married. Oh, come on. <laughs> There is no, there is no, this is what, the, what your book says, there is no guarantee of success because, because the elements of the sacrament, the grace of marriage, are not there in cohabitation. That is living in a state of fornication. Oh, those words just sound so horrible, right? Marriage takes work. Marriage takes work. That's right, that's right. Because it is not just about living together and having relationships together and having relations together. It's about the responsibility. So let's say you're cohabitating and you have a kid. Well, you know, is that okay? What happens to with the kid? What is the kid experience? What is that child experiencing when the parents can't make a commitment to one another in this way, in this way? And these are very traditional things. You know, a lot of people look at us and say, oh my God, they're so old fashioned, these Catholics are just, get over it, man. Come into the 21st century. I don't care about the 21st century. You know what I mean? People are going to be living in the 22nd and the 23rd, maybe. I don't, that's not. What I'm worried about is the kingdom that God has called us to help make happen. Right? I'm worried about not what Jesus would do, but what Jesus wants me to do. I'm worried about the call that says, this is how we are to live. If God's love is to be mirrored in us, right? It's not just about living it so everybody thinks it feels good. It's not just about saying, well, you know what? Since we can't really judge, so, okay, we can cohabitate as long as what? What conditions are you going to put on that? You can't. How are you going to make it right? It isn't. It isn't. And this is what's so hard for young people to hear because we live in a culture that says try it first. Try it first. See if you like it. If you like it, then you can keep doing it. I, I, who's not going to like cohabitating, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Sharing the bills, you know, you have sex, you're doing this. Who's going to not like that? Now, let's talk about the marriage, standing before it then. Well, I don't know if that, we don't need to do that. Look, we're happy. We don't need to do that. We don't need to put restrictions on yeah. ourselves. Huh? Just a piece of paper, they are. That's just a piece of paper. Yeah, God, if only it was a piece of paper, right? So, it's not just a piece of paper. It's not. Yeah, there, and if there isn't, you know, either you're living in marital bliss and we need to bow at your feet, or you're not living it right if there's not that struggle and not those. And that's why I say go back to that idea that on your anniversary, take a good, honest look at yourself and your spouse. Take a good, honest look at yourself and say, should she marry me again? Am I the man she married? Have I become the husband she needed me to be? Am I the wife? Am I the wife that I promised to be? Am I the wife that he deserves? Am I the wife that he gave his life for? Am I the one 
that I was in the beginning. Am I the one he should still stay with till death do us part? And if you look in the mirror and you can't say yes to that, then you need to put some makeup on, right? No. Then you need, you need to then look at that. And maybe that's when you talk to each other and say, Honey, this anniversary is the one. I, I, I really need you to know. I know I haven't been the best, you know? And, and for those things, I'm sorry. I can't promise you I'm going to be perfect, but I'm going to try to work on these things because I see. Not you've been nagging me about it, right? I see it. I see what I'm not doing in this, and I want to make that right, and I'm asking you to help me with it. And honey says, oh, baby, you're fine. Don't worry about that, right? No, that's okay. That's okay. I'm seeing it in myself. I don't feel good about it. My conscience is telling me I need to work on this. You know, my time is up. We didn't get to same-sex unions. Oh. Can I talk about that real quick? Yeah. Is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. My I'm running like I'm in the third tape already. Father's going to be like, Phew, cut her off. Same-sex relationships. This is huge right now. We know this, right? This is huge. Our children are going to be living in a world where this is becoming the norm. Not just in the civil world, but in the church, right? That, that there are churches. And we know, we know, because, again, some of you are here to become Catholic, right? You've been something else. That sometimes our children leave the church and come back. And when they leave, they go and see how other churches are living. And they say, oh, that Catholic church, they're really mean, right? Because, look, these people, it's okay. Same-sex unions are okay. Remember what those sins are. Homosexual acts. Remember when we talked about it in the beginning. It is not the person we hate. It is the act. It is the sinful act that we're against. All right? Those are the things that are really important for us to look at. Okay? That homosexual, having an identity, saying, I feel attracted. How, how you deal with that issue, I don't know. I think we're still trying to figure that out. You know, I think we're still, some of us get all icky inside when we hear that. Oh, that's got to be bad, sister. It's got to be bad, right? No. The church says we need to, if your son or daughter comes to you and says, I don't know, I, I, just, I just have these feelings, I just feel different. We don't want to condemn them and say, oh my God, you're horrible. How did this happen? You're not my son. You're not my daughter, right? It's to learn to love them in it but also call them to the responsibility. If that is their gender and sexual identity, then we must, must call them to a life of abstinence, right? I mean, that, there's no way out of this. We can't say, well, God made you that way, so you can, why? Because the act between two men and two women is not unitive and procreative. And the church does not allow them to be married. So they, that the pieces are not there. That's tough. I can tell you. You know, I said when I live in the North, I, all my liberal friends are like, oh my God, Elizabeth, I can't believe you just said these things. I have lots of friends who are gay. And I say to them, I, I, you know, I, I can't be okay with the way you're living. I have friends who live together. I know people who are not doing all the things that I think as a nun they should be doing. And they know it. <laughs> and they know it. Because I'm a nun. I walk in the house looking like this. How can they not know it, right? You all don't have habits to wear, you know? You've got to be able to walk into your friendships and your relationships and your friends know how you live out your truth. That you don't judge them, but you do call them to a lifestyle that is closer to the truth we understand the church calling us to. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, a priest has told me, he says, you know, a life for a homosexual is even harder for mm -hmm. that as a priest because they have the chastity that they didn't choose to. Mm -hmm. to yeah, it, it's the truth. It is a difficult, nobody wants this. I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, this is what you would ask for. But we are who we are. Our identity is what it is, all right? How we begin to understand it, how we begin to understand it is, you know, I, I have people say to me, oh, you know, man, come a nun, you wasted your life. Wow. <laughs> you know, you don't want a husband? You know how many people of other faiths? I mean, you guys may have known this too. You may have thought it. 
before you started thinking about this wonderful church you're about to become part of, right? Jeez, you know, what kind of life is that? They must grow up to be like old maids or something. Let me tell you, I love my celibacy. There are days when I'm glad there's no husband at home that I have to go home to, right? You know what I'm saying? There are times when I think, man, this celibacy allows me to be loving in a way that is just enormous. It allows me to love in a way that is just amazing because I can love completely. That's great. You can too, you know. But when you're loving a particular spouse, then you hold back a little bit of it for that person, right? Because you have to have that special time together. And that, that's different. I love my celibacy. I hope that you love your married lives as much. And I hope that together we can witness this so that when this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, when we look at this and we see it lived in other people's lives, we can begin to witness to them not the bad that you are, but the good that you can be, the joy that you can be, the specialness and the maturity and the responsibility and all the things we talked about tonight. Because that's really what this is saying. Don't choose the death of adultery. Choose the life of nuptial relationship, the life of marriage. That's what this commandment is calling us to, to choose life. That's it. Thank you. I'm done.